Hello and welcome to Physician Assistant Exam Review Podcast. This is Season 2, Episode 10, and today we're going to be covering disorders of the uterus. My name is Brian Wallace. I'm the host and creator here at Physician Assistant Exam Review. Uh, <clears throat> like I said, we're, we're moving through GYN. Today we're going to cover the uterus. I did want to just quick point out um, two emails I got uh, from people. One is from, I don't know, uh, there's a name, Justin. One's from Justin, and he asked a question about the pre-show questions that I asked. This was for the ovarian section. I think that would have been uh, episode eight. And it was, what hormone dominates the first half of the menstrual cycle? And I had said uh, FSH, uh, follicle-stimulating hormone. And he was had a little bit of a question because he was under the impression that estrogen would have been what would have dominated the first half of the menstrual cycle. And you know, on, on further reflection, he, he, we're both right, is the problem. And I see this a lot of times, and I, do, I, I work very hard in my re- review guide, the final step, to try to eliminate this particular problem. And the problem is that the question is ambiguous, that you can't come up with one answer. It's one of the reasons why I always hated fill-in questions on tests uh, with teachers who were, let's just say, very strict or had their, their, their mindset in a certain way. Because <clears throat> the way this question is asked, if it's an open-ended question, the answer can be follicle-stimulating hormone or estrogen. It just says which hormone dominates the first half of the menstrual cycle. I don't think really we really can give it to one or the other. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, so th- the question's worded incorrectly to come up with one specific response. And that's what I got back to him and I sort of explained, because you'll find that in a couple different places. And it just has to do with the way that the questions are worded. So again, um, not something to really be too worried about. Uh, your pants questions, your pan-read questions won't be like that. They'll be very clear. It'll be very obvious. Uh, not <laughs> Maybe not obvious, but you won't have a choice. It'll, it'll be, it's a multiple choice, and it'll be a very clear answer. Even if you don't know it, it will be set up in a way that it's a very clear answer. But sometimes when you write review books, when you write these kind of questions, you miss things that may trip people up. And in this case, that's one of those. And that drives me absolutely crazy, like I said. So I I do my best to go through the final step and remove anything like that and make it so that that's not an issue because I just don't like that ambiguity in 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 the test questions. I also just wanted to mention Tiffany up front here at the beginning of the show. She's from New Zealand and one of only a couple of PAs who are currently practicing in New Zealand. I think there was only like five of them. Um, pretty amazing that she's out there doing that. Um, I can't remember if I've mentioned her on the show here or not, but she just passed her exam, so she was super excited. She had to fly to Australia in order to take it, um, but she just found out that she passed, so she was so excited to be able to share that with the community uh, and, and just, uh, like I said, just super excited. She also wanted to mention that she used uh, Pants Prep Pearls. That's not one that I'm familiar with, um, but thought that that was a really good review book. So for those of you looking for another review book, um, uh, Pants Prep Pearls um, it might be for you. Check it out. Um, so anyway, that's it for the front end. Let's talk a little bit about uh, uterine disorders, and we'll start, as always, with our uh, priming questions. <music> What is the term for excessive, excessive menstrual flow? What is the term for excessive menstrual flow? Menorrhagia. List two non-surgical treatments for pelvic organ prolapse. Non-surgical treatments for pelvic organ prolapse. Even if you don't know, think about it. Make up something. Vaginal pessary and Kegels exercises. What is a fibroid? What is a fibroid? It's a benign tumor of the uterus. What is endometriosis? Endometriosis. An endometrial tissue that's growing outside of the uterus. Endometrial tissue that's growing outside of the uterus. All right, great. So let's jump in and move on to just some, I hope you had some of those right. If you got none of them right, don't worry about it. And again, just that act of thinking it through, working on it, uh, the problem will help this stuff stick as we move through it here uh, today. It's kind of like reading through the outline before your class. Uh, anything that gets your brain kind of uh, primed and starts to build connections, even if they're not well-formed or they're incorrect, as long as we correct them as we go, uh, that really goes a long way to help this stuff stick. So let's pick up with some terminology. Um, this one we we had in our we just <laughs> we just had in our questions. Menorrhagia is excessive heavy menstrual flow. Menorrhagia excessive heavy menstrual flow. Metarrhagia with a T instead of an N is bleeding which occurs at any time during the menstrual cycle. Menometarrhagia is heavy bleeding which occurs at any time during the menstrual cycle. 
those three I've always just struggled with. Um, but I do recommend that you get them straight in your head and you understand menorrhagia is excessive menstrual flow, metarrhagia, uh, excessive bleeding. I'm sorry, ex- uh, <clears throat> bleeding at any time. Let's see, I've already <laughs> gone ahead and screwed you guys up. Menorrhagia, ex- excessive bleeding. Metarrhagia is bleeding at any time. Dysmenorrhea is menstrual pain which occurs or interferes with activities of daily living. Dysmenorrhea. Hypomenorrhea is extremely light menstrual flow. That should be pretty easy. Next one too. All oligomenorrhea should make should be pretty easy for you. Menstrual periods which occur at intervals greater than 35 days. So not menstruating enough essentially is what that boils down to. Our first real topic for today is dysfunctional uterine bleeding or DUB. It's also known as abnormal uterine bleeding. And that's a term that's sort of going away but hasn't completely left yet. And this is abnormal bleeding from the uterus without any problems found in the uterus. So dysfunctional uterine bleeding is something, you know, we don't have any masses, we don't have any tumors, we don't have any uh, stuff, but we do have uh, excessive bleeding or bleeding at the wrong times. Clinical presentation, this is a woman of any age could possibly come in with this. And again, it's bleeding from the uterus that's not consistent with normal menstruation. So how do you go ahead and work this up? Labs and studies, blood work, obviously is going to be number one. It's just easy. CBC, iron studies, PT, PTT beta HCG, pregnancy test there, uh, an FSH level and a thyroid panel are things that are going to help you diagnose what possibly could be going on here. You're going to do a pap smear, make sure it's not a cervical issue. Uh, You can do an endometrial biopsy and see what the endometrium looks like and if there's an issue there. Pelvic ultrasound will be your next step. And then hysteroscopy, so actually taking a scope up through the cervix and into the uh, uterus to look around. And a DNC may also be helpful. So patient, <clears throat> patient continues to have blood loss, heavy menstrual flows, and off times, how do we go ahead and treat this? Well, we can just watch it and make sure she's doing okay. We can replace iron if she starts to have some uh, uh, anemia secondary to that blood loss, IV fluids, and then blood products as a um, sort of extreme result. It does happen, certainly. Women can absolutely bleed enough from the uterus to need blood products. It, it absolutely happens. Uh, hormone therapy is one way we can treat this. So oral contraception does help. Again, a DNC endometrial ablation is, is a possibility. So what that is, is basically um, the easiest way I can describe it is the, the, the surgeon takes a device and puts it up through the vagina, up through the cervix and into the uterus. And it essentially blows up like a balloon inside of the, of the uterus, coating the interior walls. And it's sort of made out of this mesh metal and then they electrify it. So it sort of burns the whole inside of the uterus. And that's an endometrial ablation. You know the term ablation. And it burns all the endometrial tissue and sort of kills it all. And this is not for somebody who wants to get pregnant again, but it's sort of step. It's sort of a good step before a hysterectomy to try and deal with um, uh, dysfunctional uterine bleeding. And so our next step would be a hysterectomy. This is something that I'm personally involved in. Lots of these. We probably do two or three of these a week at this point at my facility. At my hospital, we do probably 90% of them robotically. It's pretty amazing. The surgeons I work with at this point can really do this with you know, very minimal blood loss. Patients are going home the same night. It's a really amazing technology. We still do, do, we still, we still do some of them open. Uh, that happens. We do some of them laparoscopically, just straight uh, laparoscopic sticks. That does happen also. But I would say the majority at, at my hospital are done robotically. And like I said, <clears throat> there's a lot of debate over which uh, you know robotics versus laparoscopic work. But I just, I, I can't, the, the difference between them is amazing and what you can accomplish robotically with the minimal blood loss and the visualization and everything. It's just, it, there's no way to beat it. It's amazing in the right hands. Now you've got lots of surgeons out there who are new at it and don't know what they're doing. It certainly takes a long time to get up to speed with it. Uh, but once you have a good surgeon who's up to speed, it, it is an amazing technology. So anyway, that's hysterectomies uh, for dysfunctional uterine bleeding. Next one I see a lot uh, also in, <clears throat> in my day-to-day work is fibroids. And I personally hate seeing these because this means instead of doing a uh, hysterectomy, we may be doing a myomectomy, which is a much more difficult surgery, takes a lot longer, is a lot more uh, ambiguous as to what you're, what you're doing. And let me explain as we go, and that'll make some sense to you. Fibroids are benign tumors of the uterus. So they're these white balls, are almost like golf balls, placed into the, into the wall of the uterus. And most of the time, these don't have any symptoms. I think that when I was looking it up, it's like 50 to 90% of women have fibroids. Uh, but it's just when they're symptomatic and when they're not. There's a clear genetic component to this. African-American women certainly have a, a greater frequency of it. I think they said if the uh, mom has fibroids, the daughter is three times as likely to have them as, the, as anybody else. So there's clearly a genetic component, but nobody knows why they occur. So they're the, basically these, these golf balls, these baseballs that grow inside the uterine wall. Risk factors for this are, like I said, African-American heritage, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, nulliparity, and polycystic ovarian syndrome. 
clinical presentation. Again, if patients present, sometimes it's a, it's a um, incidental finding on ultrasound. Sometimes we'll be doing a C-section and we'll notice that they have uh, the uterus is a little oddly shaped and then you know that they've got fibroids, but it doesn't bother them. It's not something that's an issue for them, so you just leave them alone. So it's a large mass in the lower abdomen, which may be firm or irregular, that you can sometimes on the larger ones, you can actually feel um, on the, on the <clears throat> just below the belly button, you can feel the, the uterus and you can feel the uh, fibroids, uh, yeah, absolutely, or on a bimanual exam. Clinical presentation may be menorrhagia or metorrhagia or menometorrhagia, uh, dysmenorrhea, dyspari- dysperiunia, infertility, or multiple spontaneous abortions. If that fibroid is pushing into the, the uterine cavity, and taking up space, it just has a mass effect on the on the developing fetus. Um, so it can cause spontaneous abortions, and that's certainly something we do. Uh, I work with a fertility doc who does a lot of uh, myomectomies, and we t- go in and we take out the fibroids in an effort to try to make that mother be able to carry a, a viable pregnancy. Uh, urinary frequency may be another uh, possible um, symptom that patients present with. Sorry, I woke up this <laughs> this morning with this like very weird uh, kind of sore throat, kind of groggy, um, and not sure if it's allergies or what. I'm hoping it's allergies and just I go to bed tonight and it clears out. Uh, but it's Monday and the show goes out tomorrow. So <laughs> I figured either way, I'd, I'd wanted to record it and get it out on time. But that's the reason for the little bit of a cough and, and perhaps how my, my voice might sound a little bit different today. <clears throat> uh, but I definitely wanted to make sure I got this out on time. So we're pushing through um, labs and studies for a fibroids. Well, you can think about it. If we're looking for a mass in the uterus, we're going to do an ultrasound. We're going to do an MRI, um, a hysteroscopy, and then finally a laparoscopy. You're probably not going to do that as part of a workup. You're probably going to do that as part of, you know, surgically correcting the issue, but it just falls in, into the space. Treatment. So again, we can watch these. Um, they're not actually a problem in and of themselves, but definitely you see people who have trouble urinating. You see people who have trouble with bowel movements. You see people who have uh, pain, um, all kinds of things. So just, and and you, it's really just from the mass effect. These things can get huge. You can get a uterus up to the, up above the umbilicus um, that's just filled with fibroids. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, medically, you can treat them with a gonadotropin releasing agonist or GNRH agonist. The most common one right now is Lupron, Lupron. Is that the uh, the brand name? It's Luperlin. Lu- I'm not even sure how you pronounce that. Luprolin is the uh, the drug name, but Lupron is the the brand name. I doubt that that's something you'll see on your exam, but it's a gonadotropin releasing agonist. And what that does is it causes a decrease in LH and FSH, and thereby decreases estrogen, so that it sort of shrinks these things and, and gets them sort of smaller. So even if we're going to go ahead and take them out, generally patients have been on Lupron for a little bit to try and shrink them and make it a bit of an easier procedure. So surgically, like I said, we can do a myomectomy. And to do a myomectomy, what we do, uh, again, this is done robo- with uh, robotic assistance. We go in and make incisions into the uterus and look for these tumors and then shell them out and take them out and then close the uterus back up. And that sounds all nice and easy. And it actually is if the if the tumor is right on top or on the fundus. But if it's a posterior or somewhere more difficult, and if there's three, four, five, I've taken out as many as 15 of these things from one uterus, um, it can get complicated, and then to sew it all back together just takes a long time. So it can be a, a bit, pretty big procedure um, in a patient. Uh, so so it, it tends to be more straightforward from a surgical perspective to do a hysterectomy, not necessarily the best thing for the patient, but from a surgical perspective, a hysterectomy is relatively straightforward. You know what you're in for. A myomectomy, you tend to just be, uh, you're hunting around for these fibroids, and sometimes they can be difficult to find. So anyway, um, treatment for fibroids is going to either be medically, you're going to watch it and wait it, you're going to give Lupron, and surgically you can either go in and get the fibroids out, a myomectomy, or you can go ahead and do a hysterectomy and take everything out. Next, we have endometriosis. Um, <clears throat> this is the growth of endometrial tissue outside of the uterus. This is most commonly found on the ovaries. I do see that question come up from time to time. Um, in my experience, and I see lots of this, uh, we tend to see it in the in the posterior cul-de-sac quite frequently as well. But for your purposes, I would just remember ovaries as most common. Clinical presentation again is going to be dysmenorrhea, dyspareunia, and cyclical pelvic pain. That's going to be your kind of your key is that cyclical pelvic pain. The pain should get worse with um, the menstrual cycle because it's endometrial tissue that is responding to those hormones still. So even though that tissue is not inside of the uterus, you can still get, I'm sorry, it will still respond to those hormones. On physical exam, patients should have pelvic or may have pelvic tenderness. That seems a little odd um, to the examiner. You can get nodules in the pelvis, in particular in the uh, uterosacral ligaments. 
you may also find a fixed uterus on bimanual exam. So a uterus, you should be able to move it around. And when we do a, a, a hysterectomy, there's actually a device we insert into the uterus called a uterine manipulator that allows you to move it around so that uh, from above, when you're looking laparoscopically, you can get a better view by controlling the direction of the uterus. The uterus actually moves pretty freely in a normal uh, with normal anatomy. If you've got a lot of endometriosis, if you have a lot of scarring, um, if you've had something like pelvic inflammatory disease, which we'll get to later, you may have tons of scarring and the uterus may be fixed and not really mobile. And you should be able to tell that on a on physical exam, on a bi, uh, manual exam. Now, obviously, if you're in school and you're just learning uh, your bimanual exam, it's not something you're going to be able to tell right away. Um, but down the road, it definitely is something, a part of your exam that you should be able to note um, and see that the, the, uter- the uterus is fixed or not. Labs and studies, again, um, we're going to do a pelvic ultrasound, we're going to do uh, exploratory laparoscopy is often done, endometrial biopsy, and then a hysteroscopy, again, putting a scope up into the uterus. A treatment, uh, medically, you can treat this with NSAIDs for pain control, oral contraception to, to gain control over the hormone cycle and try to calm down uh, its effects. You can use a GnRH agonist, Lupron, we talked about before. Uh, surgically, you can go in laparoscopically and do laparoscopic fulguration, which is the destruction of the tissue using high voltage electricity. So basically, um, you just go in and burn it a little bit, and it gets rid of the tissue. It doesn't keep it from coming back, but it gets rid of whatever you find or whatever you see. And then, of course, you can do a hysterectomy with a bilateral salpingo oophorectomy, take out the ovaries, take out the uterus, take out the tubes, and that should clear up problems with endometriosis, but doesn't necessarily guarantee it. Next, we have endometrial cancer. So this is the most common GYN malignancy in the United States. Our presentation is abnormal bleeding in 80 to 90% of cases and pelvic pain. So basically, all these people come in with pelvic pain and abnormal bleeding, um, which which causes a bit of a problem. And the job of the clinician is to separate out what's actually causing the problem. Risk factors here are family history of colon cancer, advancing age. So postmenopausal women make up 75% of cases, which that should give you a little bit of a clue. So both when I say a clinician is trying to figure these out and determine one from the other, it's also the questions they're going to ask you on your exam, right? So they're going to ask you if a patient has this uh, bleeding uh, per vagina that's irregular, your job at that point should be starting to think in your head, is this just dysfunctional uterine bleeding? <clears throat> Might this be fibroids? Might this be uh, endometrial cancer? Might this be cervical cancer? Um, what, what, am I, what are my clues? What am I looking for? Well, one big clue here for endometrial cancer is postmenopausal women making up 75% of cases. Well, that's a huge number. So they're not going to give you a 16-year-old girl who has endometrial cancer. It's not going to happen on your exam. Fibroids tend to be African-American women, right? Tend to be obese, tend to be diabetics with hypertension. That's stuff they're probably going to include in a question stem to try and help you parse it out. They're trying to help you separate these out. I know when you take the test, you feel like they're not trying to help you. You feel as if um, (laughs) they're trying to trick you up. Uh, But I promise you, they're not trying to trick you. They're trying to give you the information you need. There just happens to be so much of it that it becomes difficult. But to me, that's the one here, endometrial cancer, that really stands out. The postpenopausal women make up 75% of of the cases. So keep that in mind. Because again, everything else is the same. We've got obesity, diabetes, polycystic ovarian syndrome, hypertension, and again, unopposed estrogen stimulation, which is nulliparity. Those are our risk factors for endometrial cancer, almost the same as our risk factors for everything else in this section, right? For fibroids, for whatever. So keep in mind those some key separators, and that's what you see here with um, African-American women for fibroids and postmenopausal women for endometrial cancer. Labs and studies, uh, you're going to get a beta HCG, you're going to get a pap smear. This is usually going to be negative, of course. But again, the thought should be, if I've got, you know, think about why these people are coming in. You're thinking, well, why do I need a pap smear for someone with endometrial cancer? Well, when they come in the office, you don't know they have endometrial cancer. All you know is they have bleeding that they shouldn't have. You've got an 80-year-old woman who comes with bleeding from her vagina, and you're thinking, geez, I don't know what this is. Maybe it's her cervix. You're going to get a pap smear. You're going to get Maybe in her, you're not going to get a beta HCG. Um, but th- yeah, that, that's the way that you're thinking about this. So don't necessarily try to memorize this list of labs and studies, but think about why you would be getting it. Um, you're going to do a vaginal and pelvic ultrasounds. You're going to biopsy uh, whatever you can find in there, the cervix and the endometrial tissue, right? Because that makes sense. If I don't know what it is and I do my workup and I can't, <clears throat> so you run through these steps. If I can't figure it out, the last step is always going to be a biopsy, some sort of surgical procedure. So you're going to start out with lab work. You're going to go into an ultrasound, and then you're going to wind up with biopsies and laparoscopies and hysteroscopies, and that sort of thing to go look around. Um, but again, that should be not, not necessarily something that you memorize, but something that 
make sense for each of these. And I know there's a lot of them to remember, but to me, it's easier to remember the things that make sense and why you're doing them than it is to memorize lists for each and every one of these. That, that to me, is really hard, although some of you are far better at it than I ever was. Treatments. Treatment for endometrial cancer. Uh, medical, first of all, for metastatic, met, metastatic disease and recurrent disease, high-dose progestins uh, may be helpful, and then you're going to do radiation and chemotherapy. Surgically, you're going to do a total hysterectomy and BSO. Um, this is also going to include peritoneal lymph nodes and tissue sampling. So we're going to take everything out. Everything goes. And when I say total hysterectomy, that includes the cervix. Uh, cervix is not stigmatized in a total. It's called a super cervical hysterectomy when you leave the cervix behind. You don't really care about that. That doesn't matter for your exam. I can't imagine that being there. Uh, but that's what a total hysterectomy and bilateral salpingoophorectomy with peritoneal lymph node and tissue sampling. Everything goes in an endometrial cancer situation. The last topic I'm going to talk about for today is another one that I deal a lot with um, in my day-to-day work at the hospital, which is pelvic organ prolapse. I work with a phenomenal uh, urogynecologist who this is basically what she fixes. And it's amazing the numbers and and the number of women who post-pregnancy and later on in life have issues with um, urinary incontinence and pelvic organ prolapse. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about... um, the uterus, the bladder, the rectum, and the small or and or the small intestine actually coming down out through the vagina. The vagina sort of turns inside out, and the organs on the inside sort of start to protrude outwards, which um, sounds about as unpleasant as it is. Uh, and this is something that um, is, you know is certainly it's it's much more common than you would ever believe. Um, so let's start with uterine prolapse. This is when the ligaments or pe- pelvic muscles weaken enough. Um, or are damaged or stretch out, usually secondary to vaginal deliveries. And the uterus actually <clears throat> begins to descend out through the vagina. It's typically not the weight of the uterus. So just simply doing a hysterectomy is not going to cut it. It's just that those ligaments are all stretched out. Uh, and this is usually secondary to pregnancy, but there are a lot of um, connective tissue disorders like ehlers danlos where people have stretchy tissue. And those women are absolutely at an increased risk for these kind of situations. A cystocele is when the bladder herniates into the vagina, so the bladder drops down. Um, it shouldn't normally be up behind the urethra, and in these cases, it drops down and begins to come out down through the uh, the vagina, which makes it then very difficult for people to void their bladder if the it has to push back up to get out through the urethra. Uh, rectocele is the rectum herniating into the vagina, and enterocele is the small intestine herniating into the vagina. All lovely thoughts. Clinical presentation. Um, patients come in complaining feeling of pelvic pressure, protrusion or bulge in or from the vagina, dyspareunia, and difficulty emptying the bladder, and then also incontinence. Um, so uh, w- <clears throat> you get issues with the urethra where the, the musculature and things aren't in the right place. So then it, these patients also tend to leak. Uh, treatment, non-surgical treatment, like we talked about at the beginning, was a vaginal pessary will help hold everything up. It's basically a plastic ring um, that you put up inside the vagina, and it's big enough that it holds pressure, and then everything stays up where it's supposed to be. Kegels maneuvers are is a group of exercises that will increase the pelvic floor muscles and help to hold everything up in place. Uh, surgically, you can um, do... <clears throat> there's a whole host of vaginal surgeries. We're not going to go into details because, although it's something I do, so... Um, I, I certainly could at this point. Um, this is not something that is going to matter for your exam. So let's just say there are a bunch of vaginal surgeries, either using using mesh or not using mesh, depending on how the extent of the prolapse and what's exactly going on and different ways you can fix it um, by doing ligament suspensions and different ways of um, suspending the, the, the bladder, again, using typically using mesh, but not necessarily. And then you can do more extensive surgeries, including hysterectomies, um, a sacral copepexy, which I'm not going to go into here what that is, or urosacral ligament suspensions are also could be necessary depending, again, on the extent of the issues that the woman is having. But really, for your, for your case, it's really just know that you can do a pessary, know about Kegel maneuvers, and then know that there are surgical corrections for uh, cystocele.